Hey, what's up, gang? I had the opportunity to play with an ATN NVM14 with a factory white phosphor tube for a couple of weeks. I've already got a video talking about the NVM14 housing in depth, so this video will cover the differences between that older model and this current model. We'll also talk about the performance of a factory tube direct from ATN, since the NVM14 that I reviewed previously had an aftermarket tube in it. We can also talk about the performance of the ATN Gen 2 white phosphor tube as compared to a Photonis Echo. So let's get right into it. This is an ATN Corp NVM14 WPT, which means it is a Gen 2 Plus white phosphor unit. Word on the street is that the Generation 2 Plus white phosphor units that ATN sells are in fact made by Photonis. However, this tube does not perform on the same level as a Photonis Echo, which is a commercially available Gen 2 Plus white phosphor tube. For starters, if you buy a Photonis Echo, you're going to get a complete spec sheet telling you most of the performance characteristics of the tube. With this unit direct from ATN, all we really have are the advertised minimum specifications. This Generation 2 white phosphor tube is also not auto-gated, whereas the Photonis Echo is auto-gated. If we just compare them in performance, the Echo has noticeably better performance. It does a little better in low light, and it has a really nice clean picture. It also has a higher resolution, 68 line pair per millimeter measured versus the estimated minimum of 62 on the one from ATN. These side-by-side -side comparisons are not perfect because no matter how many times I render this out, something happens in the encoding of the image from the ATN and VM14. Looking at these side-by-side -side in person, the performance is very close. The Photonis Echo has a slight noticeable edge, but for some reason, during either the capture or the encode, something has happened to this footage of the ATN and VM14 WPT. I've tried a bunch of settings and it always comes out looking weird. I think the slightly higher noise visible as white speckles in the image completely plays havoc with my rendering. The Photonis Echo is extremely impressive as far as Generation 2 units go, but it's still not on par with Gen 3. The Photonis Echo tube my buddy has is also in an NVM14 housing. There are a few minor differences between his NVM14 and the one I used for this video. His housing is the one I based the NVM14 comparison video off of. It only takes CR123 batteries and has a very large illuminator lens. I believe the housing I got for this video is the current model of NVM14. It has a removable insert in the battery cap that allows it to take AA batteries in addition to CR123s. That's a nice feature, I would greatly prefer to use lithium AA's instead of CR123s. You still get a generous amount of runtime on AA's, so they're just a much more economical option. The LED illuminator on this newer NVM14 is also much smaller and slightly offset to the side. It doesn't seem to make a difference in brightness or performance. I assume they figured out a way to use a slightly improved LED to make the housing cheaper and easier to manufacture. The ATN white phosphor unit also has very impressive performance, and I found it very enjoyable to use, at least once I figured out the mounting solution. Mounting options are still kind of the killer when it comes to devices other than a standard PVS-14. The NVM-14 housing has a quick rail mounting interface on either side. In the last video about the NVM-14, I mentioned trying to find a bearing optic swing arm for the quick rail interface. Since I made that video, I've gotten my hands on two of these swing arms, so now I can say safely that they are not a very good option. I think these are made for Skullcrusher style headgear. They don't work very well with a Rhino 2 with a bayonet mount. If you have it positioned on your right eye, the swing arm actually contacts part of the dovetail interface on the Rhino. It's still usable, but it's a little screwed up. Also, the way this arm works places the device too far away from your eye if you're using it with a helmet. If you were using it with a Skullcrusher or similar headgear mount, I think you could get it closer to your eye and it wouldn't be a problem. However, I tried using this on a helmet mount with a Rhino 2, and I could not get it close enough to my eye. You can somewhat compensate for the monocular being far away from your eye by using the diopter adjustment. However, it destroys your field of view. It's like looking through a tiny little soda straw. A better option is the Armacite slash Fleer swing arm. This is dovetail compatible rather than bayonet, so it will require a more expensive mount than a surplus Rhino 2. I used it with a Rhino 2 that had a dovetail conversion. This mount is adjustable left to right to position it in front of your eye, and it also places the device much closer to your eye. This is a pretty good mounting solution, although it's still far from perfect. My buddy got one of these for his NVM14, and it was pretty badly out of spec. The quick rail interface wobbles a lot, and the dovetail would not lock into his NV mount. He had to shim it with electrical tape on the quick rail, and he also had to use a Dremel in order to get the dovetail mount to lock in. These are made in Ukraine, so I just chalked that up to the luck of the draw, bad QC. I ordered one to use with this NVM14, and I had exactly the same problem. I had to grind away part of the dovetail interface in order to get it to lock into my mount, and I also had to shim the quick rail with electrical tape. 
If you're willing to do a little bit of work on it, this is probably your best, most economical option for mounting an NVM-14. I still think it's better than a JDAPT plate, for sure. Your last best option is probably the Mod Armory Swing Arm, but only the version with the dovetail interface. I had one with the bayonet interface, and it wobbled so much it was essentially unusable. The dovetail should be a lot more stable. I have a Mod Armory Swing Arm for the PVS-14 with a dovetail interface, and it is fantastic. So the Mod Armory Swing Arm is probably the best bet, but it's also very expensive. It's over twice as expensive as the Ukrainian-made FLIR Swing Arm. So, final thoughts with the NVM-14 Generation 2 Plus White Phosphor Tube. I was very impressed with the performance of this unit, and once I figured out how to properly mount it, it was completely usable. The question is if it's worth it for the price. These things cost about $2,200 retail, so it is a little bit cheaper than a brand new Generation 3 Green Phosphor PVS-14. I'm not sure if it's cheap enough though. If you ballpark the price of a Green Phosphor PVS-14, it'll probably be somewhere between $2,400 and $2,600. That'll give you a better, more rugged housing with better optics, and significantly better performance from the Generation 3 Green Phosphor Intensifier Tube. If you just compare it with other Generation 2 White Phosphor, another option is the AGM Wolf 14 with a White Phosphor Tube. These probably have very similar performance, and I think you can have them for between $1,800 to $1,900. However, the mounting options for the Wolf 14 are even worse. It's also a very big, very heavy device. And I think the lens quality is worse than the NVM 14. The Photonis Echo that we compared it to is extremely impressive. However, just the tube itself will probably run you about 1800 bucks, and you'll probably pay about $800 for a PVS 14 housing. That is too close in price to a Generation 3 unit to really make for a very good value. The only good reason to buy one of these for $2,200 is if you just insist on white phosphor. It is significantly cheaper than a Generation 3 white phosphor unit. Alright, let me know if you have any questions. I'll see you guys next time.